Hebrews chapter 7, as Sebastian just read, we're going to look uh, closer at these uh, verses and hopefully hear God speak to us. Hebrews chapter 7, we're down in verse 11 as we make our way through this great book. In the late 1980s, I began my seminary education. And that education process involved formal papers. And with a formal paper, it had to be typed. Now, <coughs> back then, I couldn't type. And today, I still can't type. But I sure can hunt and peck. I do pretty well hunting and pecking. But one thing I was blessed with was a wife that could type. And so most of the time when formal papers were due, I would write it out longhand. And then I would submit them to my typist, and then she would make her way through that typewriter. You know what a typewriter is, kids? Yeah. Kids. Not the big kids, little kids. You know what a typewriter is? Okay. What is it? <laughs> That's it. The olden things. Yep. Those olden things we used to back, use back then and just press the little letters and the black ink would be pressed up against the paper and... And then when you made a mistake, there was no but put. You got to take the paper out and do what? Get a new one or get some white out or something like that. I used to have cases of that. So I couldn't, I couldn't type. And those papers were due. And Heather would take my long hand writing. And she would then decipher it and type my papers. Well, sometimes when I was to submit a paper. I remember with the busy life I had going to seminary, uh, full-time student, full-time pastor, full-time husband, full-time dad. Uh, those things you know, took up a lot of my time. And so there were times where I exercised my spiritual gift of procrastination. And I would finish writing it all out longhand the evening before it was due. And then my wonderful wife would spend the whole night not sleeping, but typing. The next morning, I would wake up, and there she was, angelically sleeping. And I would make my way down to the table where the paper was, and I would look at the paper and think, what in the world did she write? Nothing was what I wrote down in that paper, but she had interpreted things and began to insert her own ideas. And I thought, oh, no, she could not read my writing, and I could not understand what she had typed. And we went through some difficult days there. I am so thankful, even though it was BPC, before uh, personal computers, that they came out with word processors. And the computer system was now available to people in their homes, and you could take now a computer and you could do some word processing, and you can write your papers. Even someone like me, uh, I'm able to do that. And then the thing just kept progressing, didn't it? I mean, more and more. Today, what you can do is you can speak into your computer, and it begins to type. What's next? Well, I'm thinking, what's next? Are we going to be able to think, and the computer will understand what we're thinking and begin to type? You know, man is so creative, capable of improving on the things that uh, they're already using, and you just never know what's coming next. That creativity. Now, in the case of what God is doing in the Bible concerning the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was an Old Testament way of approaching God, and that was through the priesthood. Vicariously, the priest would, on behalf of the people, come in the presence of God. They couldn't. And God didn't just all of a sudden come up with a new idea and say, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to change this thing around and I'm going to send my son and he's going to be the high priest and he is going to be the one who is going to enable people to come into my presence. This was always God's plan. Before the foundation of the world, God chose to crucify his son on our behalf so our sins might be forgiven and so that we would have the privilege to come into the presence of God. One thing about Jesus, when he came, there's nothing you can do to improve that. 
it will never get better than coming to God through Jesus Christ. And guess what? You can't add anything to it. It's already the best thing. There's nothing left for you and me to do to improve what God has made available for us through Jesus Christ. And God has sent his best for you and me. To meet what? Our greatest need. You see, our greatest need is not to communicate better. Our greatest need is not to uh, be able to uh, drive great distances or fly great distances better. Our greatest need that God provided for is that we can come into the presence of the one who created us, who sustains us, and who wants to have a relationship with us forever and ever. That's our greatest need. Now this morning, I want to share with you some needs that lead up to that, that I find in these verses, and I hope they will help you. And your outline this morning, number one. The first need. There was a need for completion. There was a need for completion. Look at verse 11 again. If then perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear? Said to be in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron. There's a question there. There was a, a priesthood in the Old Testament that made it possible for people to come vicariously into the presence of God through the high priest. Then there came the superior priesthood, as we saw last week in verses 1 through 10. The eternal priesthood of Melchizedek. If the Old Testament priesthood could actually make it possible for every person to come into the presence of God, why was there need for another priesthood? Well, the obvious answer is, it couldn't. Man could not be reconciled to God. Man could not be brought near to God. There was a barrier of sin. And the old priesthood only typified what would come that would enable the complete removement of sin and access into the presence of God. That's what perfect means. Perfect means a process of completion. God perfected his plan by sending his son the one and only true high priest who rules and reigns forever and ever. In the Old Testament, when someone sinned, they had to bring a perfect sacrifice, an animal, without any blemish. Then they would have to identify with that animal as though that animal was actually taking their place by shedding its blood for the punishment, the payment of their sin. So they had to identify with that animal. And then the worshiper had to actually slaughter that animal, inflict death upon that animal. And then the Day of Atonement would come, that one day a year, when the high priest would actually go into the Holy of Holies and there sacrifice the perfect lamb. They looked forward to that one day that their sins would be covered through this sacrificial offering. It was done over and over again because it never was able to completely satisfy the payment for sin. It could never fully cover man's sin by removing it until the perfect lamb came. It was there when John the Baptist was baptizing people and Jesus came. And he turned and told the people as he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This lamb would take away the sins of the world once and for all, and completely cleanse man from their sin. Now, if there was an in inadequate priesthood, the result would be there would be inadequate priests. And that's what verse 11 says. What further need was there for another priest to appear if the old law satisfied the covering or payment and the removal of sin? Verse 25 of chapter 7. Therefore, he 
is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. What they were incapable of experiencing through the Old Testament law of priesthood, in Christ Jesus, they were able to experience complete cleansing and coming into the holy presence of God. Jesus always, always a new high priest makes that provision for us. Jesus is always able to save those who come to God through him. Verse 9 of chapter 9. This is a symbol, speaking of the Old Testament, of the present time. That's what they were experiencing. They were experiencing that tra tradition, or transition time between Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, and then the destruction of the Old Testament law when the temple was destroyed. They were in this in-between time. And he said, this is that present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that can not perfect the worshiper's conscience. The Aaronic priesthood, Aaron priesthood, could not perfect the worshiper's conscience, could not completely cleanse them. Not even the one who was making the sacrifice, the priest himself, could his actual conscience be perfected. Verse 1 of chapter 10. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the actual form of those realities, it could never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifice they continually offer year after year. But now, through this new high priest that has come to replace the old, you have full access into the presence of God, full forgiveness of sin, and the full promise of of salvation God offers for you and me the forgiveness of our sins verse 14 of chapter chapter 10 for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified verse 27 of chapter 7 he doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do first for their own sin then for those of the people he did once and for all when he offered himself. Complete. Nothing better. Everything accomplished. Jesus Christ made it totally possible for you and me for to have our sins completely wiped away, our conscience completely clear, and the access into the presence of God sure and forever. That's what Jesus has done for us. Completely. Nothing lacking so in other words there's nothing new coming down the pike and there's nothing you and i can do to add to it all we can do is receive it accepting him as our lord and savior and god's payment for our sin number two if there was an inadequacy in the old testament law and the old testament priest system then there needed to be a change number two a need for change this is the obvious conclusion of such a question the old was inadequate. Why do we need something better? Look at verse 12. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change in the law as well. Again, in verse 28 of chapter 7, law appointed high priest men who were weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appointed a son who was who has been perfected forever. So in other words, the change, that word in the Greek means to put in another place. So the old system was now being changed. A new system was being put in its place because this was God's promise. God promised this to the Old Testament people. Those who are under the Old Testament covenant, covenant in Jeremiah 31, beginning with verse 31, he says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, this one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke even though I married them, the Lord declares. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching 
within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. That's the promise God made that he would change things and he would finalize what he had already started. There was an inability in the Old Testament law in verse 13. For the one, for the one these things are spoken about belongs to a different tribe, not from the one who served at the altar. This means this, or that means this, that the Old Testament law taught that a person who was going to be a priest, who was going to be able to come into the presence of God and actually do the temple worship, had to be from the tribe of Levi. And eventually, an offspring of Levi, who was Aaron. So in order to be a high priest or to serve in the temple as a priest, you had to be from the family of Aaron, who was from the family of Eli, uh, Levi, one of the sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel. Got the picture? This was the Old Testament law. This was the rule. See, in verse, what we're reminded of this is that when you had the priesthood and the law, the two were inseparable. For this reason, you see, in the Old Testament law, all a person can do was come close enough to God. They couldn't come all the way to God. At Sinai, they could only come to the foot of the mountain. In the temple, they can only come to the place of the Holy of Holies where the curtain separated them from the presence of God. That was the Old Testament law. It was, they were separated, and the old law was fragile, not being able to accomplish what God desired for mankind, and that was to come into his presence. Verse 28 of chapter 7 says, the, For the law appoints a high priest, men who are weak, but the promised oath which came after the law appointed a son who will be perfected forever. So there was a change, a change in the law. And this Jesus who came, came from a different tribe, not from the tribe of Levi, but he comes from the tribe of Judah. In the Old Testament, they had to come from Levi. In the New Testament, he comes from Judah. Who was Judah? Judah was of the kingly line from Jacob. So a priest and a king, which we talked about before. Now this didn't just happen. This wasn't something that just happened. All of a sudden, Jesus was born into the world and just so happened he came from the line of Judah? Let her be. It reminds us that this God is in control. The one who is the giver of life, the one who gives us that hope, is the one who is in control. Let her be the capable, the capability of the New Testament life. It was a divine fulfillment. This is what God set out to accomplish. He gave them the Old Testament law so they would learn their sin. He gave them and his, God's holiness. And he gave them the New Testament covenant in Christ Jesus so they would know his complete forgiveness. Verse 14. Now this is evident that our Lord came from where? Judah, a, a family line that had nothing to do with temple worship. They weren't allowed to serve in that capacity, but they did serve as kings. So this priest who comes is a king. He comes from Judah, and Moses said nothing about this tribe concerning priests. Now, he came from, that same word in the Greek is used in chapter 2, verse 14. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these. Coming and sharing are both the same, have a, have a, have a similar word in the Greek. It basically means when he shared, it was something that he chose to do. When he came, it was something that he chose to do. In other words, he was directing the plan. He was the one in charge. He chose to come through the line of Judah rather than the line of Levi. Did you do that when you were born in this world? Did you sit somewhere and, and just have a conversation with God and say, God, when I go into this world, I, I want to go into the family of? But God did that. You weren't even in existence. But Jesus chose 
what he was going to do. It's just a reminder for you and me that God is in control of this plan. And you're not going to find a better plan anywhere than the plan that God has for you and me through Jesus Christ. It was an intentional choice, and it was God's decision to be born into the tribe of Judah. He chose that kingly line. And as a reminder, one of their greatest kings said in verse 17, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, on that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner of the peoples. Or the Jesse's, Jesse came from the line of Judah. Jesse was David's dad. It's a reminder again, from that lineage, this great high priest would come. In verse 15 of that same chapter, verse, verse 15 and 16 of chapter 7 of our passage this morning. And this becomes clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on the legal commands concerning physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. There's the key. The power was in the fact that he had an indestructible life. Every priesthood in the Old Testament system eventually died. Even though Jesus was crucified as the Lamb, he raised himself and lives and reigns and rules forever. Like no other priest. Like no other priest in the Old Testament. The root of Jesse in Jer Jeremiah 23, 5 tells us, That day is coming. This is the Lord's declaration. I will raise up the righteous branch of David, and he will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. It's that life power that he gives us. It's the life that he has that he extends to you and me, enabling us to have life in God and to come into that living presence of God unhindered because our sins are forgiven. You see, only life can overcome death. You know, the, the greatest need that we have is to come into the presence of God. But unfortunately, we have a problem with sin, and we have a problem with death that does not allow us to come into the presence of God. We are dead spiritually, which does not allow us to come into his presence. We are dead spiritually because of the sin in our lives. But God has met those needs. He has forgiven us sin. He has not given us death, but he has given us life. And he has given us access into his beautiful presence. Only life can over, overcome death. Only forgiveness can overcome sin. Only light can overcome darkness. Only bread from heaven can overcome spiritual hunger. And only being clothed in Christ can overcome the nakedness of our sinful nature. And only divine wisdom can overcome the ignorance of humanity. And only the creative, sustaining power of God gives victory over the defeating Deceiving power of Satan. If that complete privilege and perfection of coming into the presence of God was accomplished in the Old Testament covenant, there would be no need for the new. But it couldn't accomplish that purpose but Jesus did something had to change and guess what the law didn't just have to change you and I have to change we have to change being here this morning can only have a fulfillment in God's plan is that if you and I walk out of this place, we are changed because we met God. If you're the same person leaving this place as you came in, you did not meet God. When you and I meet God and He speaks to us, our lives are continually being changed. And we need God to speak to us today. You don't need me to speak. You need to hear what God wants to say to you. And when God says something to you, guess what? You will be changed if you respond to what he says. You see, we can never go on to perfection. We can never go on to what God wants us to be. We can never go forward in this growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ while we continue to stay the same. 
You can't stand still and go forward with God at the same time. We will never go to or continue with God staying the same. A change must take place. You see, in God's plan, it's a fulfillment of that reminder something has to change. And God is in the people changing business. And he wants to change us forever. So what needs to take place? Number three, there's a need for cleansing. There's a need for cleansing. There's a need for completion. There's a need for change. And now there's a need for cleansing. Look at verse 18 of our passage. So the previous command is annulled because it is weak and unprofitable. For the law, what does it say? Perfected what? Nothing. The law perfected nothing. Well, what did it do? Letter A. It only revealed sin. That was the law's purpose. Yes, it shows us the holiness of God. The greatness of God. How morally perfect God is. But the law only reminds us that you and I, we fail to meet God's standard. That's what sin is. Sin is missing the mark. The Bible says, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. His standard, his perfection. And as a result, you and I have died spiritually and we deserve God's just punishment. All the law did was to show us that we have a need to change. We're a mess. In Romans chapter 3, verse 20, For no one will be justified in his sight by the work of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. In Psalm 19, 7, it says, The law is wonderful, converting the soul. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, What should I say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not, Paul said. On the contrary, I would not have known sin if it was not for the law. For example, I would have not have known what it is to covet if the Lord had not, if the law had not said, do not covet. The law has its purpose, not to perfect us, but to show us how imperfect we are and how separated we are from God and how much we are in need of coming into his presence. We need God's forgiveness. And 1 Peter 1, 10 and 12 say a similar thing about the purpose of the law. But letter, so it could never remove sin. But letter B, the New Testament totally removes sin. When I say totally, what I mean? Completely. Perfect. Nothing else needed. Matthew 26, verse 28. Jesus said, as he was having that first Lord's Supper with his disciples, he said this about the cup. He said, this is my blood that establishes the covenant it is shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. My blood forgives sins. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, in him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through... Uh, 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 redemption is... For the, uh, through the shedding of his blood, the forgiveness of sin. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And back in verse 7 of that same chapter, it says, His blood cleanses us from all our sins. How are we going to be cleansed? There's only one possible way for you and me to be cleansed in the presence of God. To see us as completely perfect from his perspective. And that is when we trust the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sin. It doesn't cover our sin like the Old Testament law did. It removes our sin. It's a rush and it's a river and it's flowing and it washes away our iniquity and it cleans us and it makes us right in the presence of God. Righteous, holy, perfect in his presence. So why is that cleansing needed? Why, why is it needed? Why do we have to have that cleansing? For what reasons? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood 
of the Messiah. Near to what? Near to God. James chapter 4, verse 7, the cleansing, he says this, Therefore submit to God. But resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded people. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Your laughter must change to mourning and your joy to sorrow. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. God says, I'm offering you a way to meet your greatest need. To come into my presence. And the only way that's possible is through the cleansing power of the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. The perfect sacrifice. The lamb of God who gave his life so that we might be forgiven and be able to come in the presence of God. Number four, our last need, and this is it, our greatest need. Our greatest need is for communion. I'm not talking Lord's Supper here. I'm talking coming into the presence of God. That's your greatest need. Maslow doesn't teach us that. But the Bible does. Our greatest need is the forgiveness of sin, the power of life, and to come in the presence of God through a new living way, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 19. But a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. You get the picture? I hope you do. Being an Old Testament worshiper, there was only one person who could actually go into the presence of God and no one else could. It could not do that perfect work of bringing us into the presence of God. Only through Jesus Christ, God's completion of his plan of redemption enables us through that high priest, through that king, to come into God's presence. Now, letter A. You cannot come into God's presence with zeal. You cannot come through zeal. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 2. G, uh, Paul said this concerning his, his Jewish brothers. He said, brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. I can testify about them that they have zeal for God. You know, zeal for God is, do you? Excited about the things of God. But they have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. Who of us is not impressed with those, especially yesterday, riding their bikes through our streets, trying to stop you and have a conversation about God? Folks, they have a conversation about God. They have a zeal about God. They have an excitement about God. But if they don't know Jesus Christ as the true and only God, it doesn't matter how zealous they are about what they do. It doesn't matter how zealous you are about your church. It doesn't matter how zealous you are about your ministry. It doesn't matter about your, your fervent, fervency in prayer, your giving, your service. If you have a zeal for all of those things, of godly things, it means absolutely nothing if you do not know God. You can have a zeal for all the wonderful things of God, and folks, we should have, but they can never replace knowing God. Knowing Him. So let her be. We must come through knowledge. Knowing him. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not by working righteousness that we do, but according to his mercy, through the washing of the regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out this Spirit abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that we having been justified his grace, may become heir, heirs in the hope of eternal life. And he goes on and says, but avoid foolish debates, genealogy, quarrels, and disputes about the law, for they are, they are unprofitable and they are worthless. All of it's worthless if you don't have the knowledge of God. I didn't say about God. 
A lot of Christians today have a knowledge about God, but they don't know him in a relationship. Does that make sense? People know about God, but they do not know him. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that you may know the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Now, conversely, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons? Didn't we pray? Didn't we go to church? Didn't we serve as a pastor in your church? Didn't, wasn't I a deacon? Didn't I do all these wonderful things? And he said, then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Knowing God is also God knowing you. The point is this, God knows all things. He knows about you, but he wants to know you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be able to speak to you so you can speak to him. How many Christians I hear today when I say, how's your relationship with the Lord? I pray every day. Well, that's not a relationship. That's a one-way street. When does God get to speak to you? He has given us his word. He has given us the Bible so that we can open it and have him speak to us. He has given us his Holy Spirit who is able to teach us about who God is, the deep things about God. That's what God wants for us. And you and I have been privileged through Jesus Christ to come into the presence of God through his blood so that we may commune with him. Now we ought to be excited about the things of God. But like I said, there's no substitute for knowing him through communion with God. Too many Christians today, I shared this Wednesday night, too many Christians today are excited about and zealous about the issues of God. Christians today are excited about the findings as they study God's word, these little nuggets of truth. Christians today are excited about their ministries, but very few Christians today are excited about what God is saying to them because they don't hear God speaking to them. Get in a conversation with a Christian. And say, hey, what are you doing serving the Lord? They can tell you a whole list of things they're doing to serve the Lord. Tell me what's important about the, the, the doctrine and the teaching of God. And they can give you a whole bunch of things. And then ask them this. What has God been saying to you as he's been speaking to you through his word and his spirit? And then a silence comes. And you have to say to yourself, what's wrong? Something's wrong. Now, there have been those of you who, on Wednesday night, when you share with us what God's been saying to you, and I'm telling you, there's not much in my life that gets me more excited than to hear what God is saying to you. To hear the Tressler family tell us that through a study, God began to speak to them and to guide them into the ministry he wants for them. That blesses my heart. I hate the fact that we're going to lose this family. But I love the idea that they have been walking with God and God is leading them because they experienced his manifestation speaking to them. The Bible offers us this privilege. And you and I have to do it. In Isaiah, he says, draw near to me. Everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And without money, come and buy everything I have for you. It's all available. I'll give you even the money you need to purchase it. I've already paid the price. In, chapter six, in, in that same chapter, verse 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will freely forgive. Psalm 65, 4, how happy is the one you choose to bring near to live in your courts. You will be satisfied with the goodness of your house and the holiness of your temple. Psalm 145, verse 18, the Lord is near to all of those who call on him with integrity. That's what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. 
He's given us the old law, the Old Testament, to show us our need so that we will know that we are a mess without God. He's given us the New Testament so that we may know his forgiveness, but most importantly, that we may know him and walk with him in his holy presence. Folks, there hasn't been anything in these last few months that has spoken to me more than what God has spoken to me in this sermon. As I prepared for this, it was a reminder how woefully short I fall from what God truly wants for me. He doesn't want me to be a great pastor. He doesn't want me to be a great minister. He doesn't want me to be a great father. He doesn't want me to be a great husband. He wants me to walk with him. And he'll take care of everything else. It's so easy to lose focus, my friends. Let me ask you, person, who does not know Jesus Christ, what are you waiting for? What are you going to wait for? You're going to wait for one day that you're going to have to meet him through your death. It's for each man to die once, then comes not opportunity. The Bible says, then comes judgment. Why will you continue to wait? Why won't you respond to God's wonderful gift of salvation today so that he might change you eternally? Christians, it's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to come into the presence of God and let him speak to us. And he, as he manifests himself to us and shows us who we are and who he is so we might know him and he might know us. What are you waiting for? The time is now for us to change. And God wants to change you and me. Father,